Great, Great to have everyone. everyone. Thanks, Thanks all for, for, uh, for being, being here. here. So, so now, now let's, let's get started. started. Again, Again, people in the back, if you can uh, take, take your seats, seats that'd, that'd be great. great. There are still, still some seats in front. Uh, if you can take your seats, that'd be great. Okay, great. So welcome, everyone, um, to our ZKP workshop and uh, hackathon demos and uh, awards yeah. ceremony. Uh, we are starting, so if people can stop talking, then that would be great. Okay, and then, <laughs> and then after the event, the award ceremony, we'll have a reception and also the career fair and dev info session uh, for, for the students and participants. Okay, great. So, so I think everyone here has uh, learned about the Zero Knowledge Proof MOOC. It has been uh, a great success, and so we are really happy to have several of the co-instructors here. Uh, so Shafi and Dan are here uh, as well. And uh, we'll actually do a fireside chat uh, just in a little while. And also, uh, right, and then the reason for everyone to be here is together with the ZKP MOOC, uh, given that there's so much interest, uh, we've uh, done the, uh, the ZKP Web3 hackathon uh, in the last uh, two months. So, um, so here are just some quick stats about the ZKP MOOC and the ZKP Web3 hackathon. So globally, we have close to 4,000 participants in the ZKP MOOC. Given you know, the advanced level of the topic and so on, it's really great to see so much enthusiasm uh, and so on. And uh, Shafi gave the first lecture in the ZKP MOOC, and the lecture actually has over 16,000 views. Uh, that's great. And then for the, and for the hackathon, for the ZKP hackathon, we have uh, close to 600 participants from uh, over 60 countries participating with uh, around 150 teams registered. And uh, for today, essentially after the, uh, the initial submission, we have selected about the 30 finalist teams across the five tracks and the varying categories. And um, that's what everyone here will be seeing, the final presentations from these 30 finalist teams. So really the goal for the ZKP uh, Web3 Hackathon is to grow the ZKP community and advance the ZKP technology. And uh, as we have introduced earlier about the Hackathon um, uh, overview, uh, the Hackathon is actually specially designed uh, and has five tracks, the ZK application track, the ZK bridge track, ZK circuits, and ZK benchmark track. And uh, also there's a sponsor track uh, for writing ZK applications with the Snarky GS. Uh, from OMA Labs, uh, sponsored by Near Gov Dev Track, and um, and also we really um, a big thanks for the sponsors, for partners and sponsors. Thanks to the partners and sponsors for this hackathon, we have up to over uh, two hundred thousand in prizes. So these thirty finalist teams will be competing uh, among these prizes, and also huge thanks to the judges uh, for this hackathon as well, and uh, that. Uh, the, the various designs and so on for the hackathon uh, uh, is, um, uh, over, uh, is overseen by the hackathon co-chairs. Great, so for today, we are first going to see the final demos and award announcements of uh, first uh, two tracks, ZK Bench and ZK Bridge track. And then we are going to have a fireside chat with Dan and Shafi and our moderate and um, on future of uh, ZKP. And, also, and then we'll see the Final demos and award announcement for the um, uh, for the remaining tracks, uh, and at the end we'll have reception and the Web3 ZKP uh, career fair. So lots of exciting stuff. So now let's get started since we have a very limited time. Uh, time. So first we are going to do the ZK benchmark track. So first we are going to see the finalist demos. Welcome everyone to the final presentations of the ZK Benchmarks track. In this track, we invited participants to collaborate on developing a benchmarking framework for ZK Snarks called ZK Harness to further improve transparency and enable non-experts to choose the best solution for their needs. You can access ZK Harness by scanning this QR code. ZK Harness is a flexible framework for benchmarking zero-knowledge proofs to enable community members to contribute in a standardized manner which ensures that new ZKP frameworks hardware configurations and measurement workloads can be integrated with minimal effort. By defining a generic set of interfaces, benchmarks can be invoked through a configuration file, which subsequently generates a standardized output for a given benchmarking scenario. 
Currently, it covers benchmarks for arithmetic operations in prime fields, operations over groups of elliptic curves, as well as end-to-end -end circuit executions. Today, our finalists will present their solutions and insights on dedicated tasks divided into four categories. Benchmarking mathematical operations, circuit implementations, recursion, and ZKVMs. Additionally, we encourage participants to propose self-selected tasks such as arithmetizations, polynomial commitments, uh, and GPU acceleration, amongst others. The results of their work will contribute to the growth of ZK-SNARK technology and its adoption. We appreciate the community's collective efforts in this endeavor and would like to thank all participants for their contributions. Without further delay, let's hear from our finalists and explore the outcomes of the ZK Benchmarks track. Hi, this is Mo from Sutter. Uh, Sutter is a very generalized interoperability protocol that connects to multiple different blockchains. And uh, we uh, do asset bridging and the cross-chain messaging and all that stuff. And uh, very recently, we announced something called Bravius, which is a zero-rush omnichain data attestation platform that enables smart contracts themselves to access, compute, and utilize arbitrary data across multiple different blockchains in a completely trust-free way. Uh, there are a lot of exciting use cases enabled by Bravius. For example, ZK Bridge would be uh, the most obvious one, uh, but there will also be data-driven DeFi, like you can finally have VIP programs in uh, the DAXs. And in many other uh, areas like user acquisition, user lifecycle management, uh, ZK DID, and account abstraction, and many more different exciting use cases. During the process of building Bravius, we launched something called the Pantheon of Zero Knowledge Proof Development Framework, which is essentially uh, a test bed to allow uh, new developers to onboard ZKP quickly by looking at a comprehensive set of benchmarks. So this is very much the same line of work that is uh, being done by ZK Collective's uh, ZK Harness team. So we thought it would be interesting to participate in the hackathon. And in this hackathon, uh, we extended the, the framework significantly by adding support for Plunky2, Starky2, GNARK, and uh, you know using the SHAR-256 um, uh, benchmark framework. So we did this PR and also uh, this next thing here uh, that is adding the support for uh, all these frameworks. Going forward, we would love to continue the merge effort with uh, the ZK Collective team and the ZK Harness team to build and build the best uh, test bed and benchmark framework in the industry. We're Team Winterfell. My teammate is Tom Urich and I'm Jocelyn Malvay. Our goal was to answer the following question. Can we, in a principled way, categorize which arithmetization is best suited for which kind of computation? In order to tease out the impact of arithmetization, do you want to isolate just the arithmetization and have everything else be identical? Our starting point for this was the Winterfell uh, Rust crates, implementing an error-based dark proof system. We used the math and crypto libraries of Winterfell to implement Fractal, which is all of the same backend, but instead of of error it is based on R1CS. Now that we have two proof systems built on the same code, how do we compare them? We need to implement some examples. For this, we chose Fibonacci and FFTs. For R1CS, we implemented these using JSNARK. For Winterfell, it already had some examples. We extended this to include an FFT example. Finally, we unify all of these in a benchmarking suite. That's the main link that we submitted. The readme for this contains uh, links to all the other repositories. Let's see this benchmarking repository in action. If I want to benchmark and error proof for the correct run of an FFP of length 128. I can run it if I want to do the same thing for fractal. I run it like so. Of course, this is not principle. You actually want to use a benchmarking suite. So you just run it using cargo bench. We won't wait for that, but this is still a work in progress and we will continue to improve as well as add more features and paradigms to the system. Hello, um, this is Morgan Thomas. I'd like to demonstrate the next code that I wrote for the ZK Harness Benchmark Suite. Uh, what this code does is it allows you to, on a Next compatible system, uh, such as Linux or Mac OS, uh, easily create a development shell uh, with the correct dependencies, which will allow you to compile, develop, and run this benchmark suite. I'm going to illustrate this using a fresh clone of the ZK Harness repo that I'm making right now. This can be into that. Check out the Next branch. Um, now, before I enter the uh, development environment, before I have it create that environment, I'm going to illustrate uh, there is no CIRCOM on my path. Now I run Nix develop, um, and this would take longer on a machine where this has never been run, because right now all of the dependencies, for the most part, are cached in the Nix store. Um, so all it really needs to do here is um, install the additional dependencies, the Python and Node.js dependencies, which are not included in the cache because they're managed by Python and Node.js. 
Um, so, so now we're in the development shell, um, and uh, you can see now there is a circle on my path, um, and I'm going to uh, run one of the targets in the make file. Um, I'm going to run benchmark void circon. We can see it working. And I'll just uh, let that run for a minute. And once it's done, I'll, I'll show you uh, some of the results that it created. OK, so now it's done. And we can see it created a new file. Oh, no, it didn't create a new file. It modified an existing file. It added uh, the results of running the benchmarks on my machine. Um, and similarly, you can run all the other benchmarks in suite using this next environment. Hey, everyone. I'm Bing. I built a super simple preliminary version of a Rust-based benchmark runner for ZK Harness. So this is meant to be extendable to other Rust frameworks and libraries that we might want to benchmark, as well as it respects the current way that ZK Harness is built. So I'll show you what that means by running the demo. Uh, let's run a bunch of uh, benchmarks that I included. And this basically runs ZK Harness, as well as the new Rust-based runner uh, that's running the benchmarks in release mode. And let's see the into the app and look at the results. So we are on locals 8050 and let's take out growth 16 here and start JS and you can see that there's a new section here with a new framework uh, with new benchmarks. Uh, that's all for my demo. Uh, thank you. for the as a ZK bench track. So first we thank the, uh, the participants and especially the finalist teams who have made high quality submissions. Oh, oops. Um, okay. Um, and these teams uh, have uh, made great contributions. And uh, to help the community together to build this uh, ZK bench, uh, the, the ZK harness uh, framework, uh, to contribute to the ZK harness framework. Uh, so with that, uh, the judge uh, committee has um, uh, essentially has uh, ranked the teams. So the uh, the Winterfell is first place with uh, two thousand uh, dollars in prizes, and uh, the second place are tied between Seller Network and uh, Morgan Thomas with uh, $1,000 each in price. And uh, Bingsico is the third place with uh, $500 uh, in price. And these are uh, these prices are sponsored by Jump Crypto. So. Thank you. So the next track is a ZK Bridge track. Hello. Can you Hello, I can. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Can you share your screen? I think it'd be easier. Okay. And can you hide self view? Hide self view, sure. Um, view just. Okay, how's that? Okay. Hello, can you guys see? Yes. Um, our mic is off. Uh, yeah, we can see you. Okay, I will get started. Before we announce the winner of the ZK Bridge track, let me quickly introduce ZK Bridge. So um, today, the blockchain space is a multi multi chain universe in which multiple blockchains coexist and supporting different uh, um, applications. So a bridge is a system to enable generic and efficient communications across different blockchains. How do you build a bridge? Well, one way to build a bridge is to introduce a trusted intermediary to facilitate the message passing between uh, the sender and the receiver chains. However, this approach introduces additional trust, which is not desirable. 
So the question is, can we build bridges, practical bridges, without any additional trust? So with DKP, the answer is yes. We can replace this trusted intermediary with uh, cryptographic proofs, zero knowledge proofs. So the high level idea is instead of trusting the intermediary, you ask them for a zero knowledge proofs to prove the correctness of the messages they deliver. So this approach, which we call ZK Bridge, enjoys several very important uh, advantages, advantages, including minimize the trust, efficient on-chain verification, um, permissionlessness and being decentralized. Last but not least, the design of the K bridge itself is universal and modular. So the bridge can be built out of different modules and, and building blocks. So that's exactly the goal of the K bridge track, which is to build out, build towards this ZK bridge system, um, you know, uh, um, building block by building block. We have several different categories focusing on various uh, components of the bridge. So with that, we can start this. Should I click start? Okay, I guess we, should, we can play it here, right? Uh, we can play the video here. Uh... Hello, Berkeley Hackathon. My name is Levi Sled. My collaborator is Alexei Kalmikov, and we built a Ketchak 256 circuit in GeneArc. So I'm going to run one of the tests so you can see what happens. And here is our main file. The way it works is we take in an array of bytes. Front end variable is GeneArc API's general number, and um, it spits out four front-end variables, but these are uint 64s, 64-bit unsigned integers. And that's 256 bits, so that's the hash. And um, you can see in our test file, we've got this test that's you know, taking 20 bytes and taking the hash of that. And you can see, after running this, that GNR compiled the circuit, um, built constraints, and ran a growth 16 proof on that. So now I'm going to show you some benchmarks. So here we have another variable length Ketchak 256 hash circuit written in CIRCOM by Arak, another contestant in the hackathon. And we decided to benchmark our implementation against theirs just to see if we had the right number of constraints approximately. And it looks like we do. I mean, you can see that these uh, implementations are very close in the number of constraints that they have. For small inputs, theirs has fewer constraints, whereas for larger inputs, ours has fewer constraints. And they're growing about linearly in each case. Um, so I take that as a good sign. Uh, that is our project in a nutshell, and thanks everyone for listening. Hello, everyone. This is Team Private Bridge. Uh, I'm Sriram, and uh, we have Enhau, Fan, and Nino with us. And uh, our project is on privacy preserving asset swaps via Zika Bridge. So why do we want to do this? So it's common for users to engage in multiple blockchains, and they frequently want to move assets from one chain to another. And why? Because different chains have different properties. For instance, Zcash has privacy, Ethereum has smart contracts, and so on. And current solutions for, for private chains, for instance, from Zcash or other chains, usually require trusted third parties and do not provide user privacy. So we seek to fill in this gap, and uh, we want to build a chain from Zcash to Ethereum that also provides privacy. So here's our contribution. First, we define the notion of privacy. Second, we propose a privacy preserving protocol between Zcash and uh, Ethereum that allows asset swaps. And finally, we provide an open source implementation of the protocol. So here's our workflow. As you can see, it builds on top of the ZK Bridge Relay Network. Um, for our implementation of the code, we present our circum and slit implementation. For circum, we have implemented the Black 2 256 hash, which is used in Zcash implementation, and also implemented the Zcash transaction digest in circum. Next up, please. As for solidity, uh, we have implemented the verify and means which verifies the uh, zero knowledge proofs and means the uh, Z, uh, ZC token on uh, solidity and also written test, uh, test scripts to test this functionality's correctness. And you can see on the next slide, um, um, it can be uh, our code plus the test. Thank you. Hello everyone, this is Team Private Bridge. Uh, I'm Sriram and uh, we have Enhau, Fan and Gino with us. And uh, our project is on privacy preserving asset swaps via Zika Bridge. 
So why do you want to do this? So it's common for users to engage in multiple blockchains and they frequently want to move assets from one chain to another. And I have a team L1 state Oracle. You cannot trustlessly try and travel L1 state on L2. Here's the problem. ZK Bridge enables trustless messaging between L1 and L2 chains, but they don't give L2 access to L1 on-chain data. But what if I want to check the ownership of CryptoPunk at a certain block number? So NosaSim introduced an idea about creating tools on top of a block header. First, Hashi allows you to fetch the L1 block header on L2. It provides it additive uh, security by comparing the block header value from multiple bridges. Second, Axiom allows you to create a ZK storage proof associated with the block header. So combining these two, we can trustlessly look up L1 state on L2, simply by checking the block header from those two. So let's say that the user wants to check who owns this CryptoPunk at this block. Here, Hashi sends a reliable L1 block header to L2 by using the multiple bridges. On Axiom, we fetch the historical L1 storage value, and we create a ZK proof. This proof includes L1 storage value associated with the block header. We then submit the block header hash with the proof to L2 verifier. We check the quality of the block header reported from Hashi. On L2, we decode the L1 storage value from proof provided. The block header hash ensures us that the value is correct as it's derived from the Merkle tree. Here, we create a proof for the owner of uh, CryptoPunk at this block. Uh, here's what's inside the proof. You can see the owner's address at the value. Uh, on L2 contract, we compare the block header from the hash and the one from proof. We verify the proof on chain. If verified, we retrieve the slot value, which is CryptoPunk address for us. This can be saved on chain to be used for other contracts. Here, we can check the address is verified on L2. And OpenSea, you can check the owner was the same for this block. Thank you. Good afternoon, I'm Danny Villarde, and I worked on the XRPL ZK page track. I gave a proposal and partial implementation of the ZK page. The structure I used is the same one as the one proposed by the ZK page paper, and therefore, the main part of the implementation would be to have the light sign protocol as a circuit. XRPL uses a Byzantine fault tolerance like consensus protocol, so the idea would be to check the signatures validity of the servers that take part in this consensus. The problem is that no signatures from the consensus are stored in the block once it's uploaded in the chain. Nonetheless, we can still get access to the signatures by having a verifier server running. This will even encourage XRPL users to have verifier servers. I implemented this light client verification using GeneArc in order to see the, if proof valid generation could be done in a centralized way or if using DeVirgo would be needed. To generate the proof that 80% of the 90 signatures are correct, we would just need 3 seconds. These values are calculated using the MIMC hash function instead of the SHA-512, so it would take approximately 7 times what it currently takes since SHA-512 is less ZKP friendly. This still has short time for proof generation, but it could be greatly improved by doing this in a decentralized way, generating each signature's proof separately and then batching all the proofs together in a, into a single proof. Finally, mentioned that the original idea was to use hooks in order to substitute smart contracts use in the Zeki Bridge paper, but they run transaction time logic and therefore can't lock tokens. They are not a good idea either to generate the proof as it would be expensive and doesn't need to be done transaction time for it to be valid. We can lock tokens with a non yet enabled transaction called exchange commit. Thank you very much. Hello, Berkeley Hack. the slide to the winner's slide you can speak yeah. okay um so among the finalists, the judges have selected the three winners. In category one, circuits, the uh, first place goes to the team, uh, Kachak in GNARC, for a price of $1,000. For implementing the widely used uh, uh, Kachak 256 uh, uh, circuit in GNARC. In category five applications, the first place goes to the team um, bri private bridge for a price of around $2,000 for building a privacy preserving bridge from Zcash to Ethereum. And in category th uh, six, the first place goes to ZK World for implementing a defense in depth layer two bridges with an award of amount $2,500. All of the words on this page are sponsored by Gnosis Builders.
Thank you. Hey everyone, um, I'm Anshul from Ripple. I lead the research team at Ripple. Um, we're really impressed by the submission. It's only recently that we have started looking into zero knowledge proofs for XRP Ledger. So it's the submission in itself is, we think, is a really good step in the right direction. Uh, so um, we plan to, like, we, we are happy to offer a thousand dollar in prize for the submission and really look forward to more future collaborations. Thank you. Great, thanks everyone. So, so far we've announced, uh, we've done the final demos and announced the winners for two tracks, uh, the ZK Benchmark track and the ZK Bridge track. Uh, so now we are going to do a short fireside chat. Uh, we are really glad to have the uh, co-instructors of the ZKP MOOC, uh, Dembone and uh, Shafi Gawasa here uh, to uh, join together for a uh, for fireside chat on the future of uh, ZKP. Um, and so there are people standing in the back. There are still some seats in front. So if you want to move to the front, uh, right, you can take the opportunity. OK, great. Oh. OK, great. So, so Dan Shafi. Okay. Oh, great. Okay. So, so yes. Yeah, so Dan Shafi do not need the uh, introduction. Uh, so I really uh, uh, strongly recommend everyone to go check out the ZKP MOOC uh, videos, the lectures from uh, from Shafi and Dan. Um, and just very briefly, right? So, so Shafi uh, uh, again, without <laughs> needing an introduction, is a Turing Award winner uh, and is a co-inventor uh, for zero knowledge proofs. So it's particularly you know, uh, really, uh, uh, really great to have Shafi being part of the ZKP MOOC and uh, being here today. Um, and also Shafi is, uh, has been a director for the Simons, uh, the Berkeley Simons uh, Institute uh, with, uh, for the theory community and so on. It's been really great. Um, and then, of course, it's, uh, it's an amazing uh, scholar researcher in cryptography and so on, and uh, also has many awards and then the faculty at Stanford. And also, I was told that uh, today, uh, Dan has been, it has been announced that Dan has been elected as a, as a member of the National Academy of Science uh, today. So congratulations, <laughs> Dan. <laughs> so, so yes, we are really happy and fortunate to have Shafi and Dan uh, joining the fireside chat uh, today. So. Uh, right, so the MOOC and uh, the hackathon is about ZKP, and uh, so there are a lot of uh, really interesting topics to discuss. So maybe we can start something simple, uh, since there are also newcomers, I think, uh, potentially in the audience as well. So, so maybe uh, given uh, uh, Shafi and Dan's rich experience in the space, so maybe you can uh, just first uh, talk a little bit about what's your favorite analogy for explaining zero knowledge proofs to someone who's never heard of them before. Um, well, there are many analogies over the years, you know, because you're trying to explain zero knowledge, but it really depends on the uh, level of the listener. So if it's a child or it's an adult or it's an expert in the field, you would give a different explanation. But I saw something recently, so I'm going to use that, which was by a... a uh, son of a colleague of mine, where he saw a movie episode of this uh, f um, a series called Suits, where they're lawyers, and one lawyer, in the case is that they're accusing uh, a firm for doing inside uh, trading or something, and because it doesn't make any sense that they have such an incredible track record at earning money. And, um, and he's saying, no, it's, we have software that manages to trade 
properly. And they say, well, expose the software. He says, if I expose the software, then I'm going to lose my edge. And uh, zero knowledge proof would enable you <laughs> to uh, prove that you have the software that produced these predictions without revealing the software. Uh, so that's an, uh, kind of a nice example that came out of nowhere. They didn't actually use zero knowledge proofs. They didn't know what the solution is. They just presented the problem. But I think it's a good way to explain. Yeah. I guess the public isn't quite aware of what's, what's possible and what's not possible. Um, so let's see. So actually, there, there are two aspects to zero knowledge proofs, right? There's the zero knowledge aspect, which is a privacy aspect. And then there's a, the, the, the part, the other part we care, also care a lot about, which is the succinctness aspect, uh, which is that the proofs are very short and uh, easy to verify, at least in the context of SNARKs. And so Shafi gave a, a zero knowledge example. I think you all know the Where's Baldo example for explaining the privacy uh, of zero knowledge. Where's Baldo, by the way, to give credit where credit is due, uh, Where's Baldo is a paper that was written by Yael Noor et al. when she was about 10 years old. Yeah, so kind of a cool paper to check out. Uh, there are Sudoku examples, right? I have a puzzle, I have a solution to Sudoku, and I want to prove to you in zero knowledge that I know the Sudoku. So those are very simple examples. Since Shafi gave a zero knowledge example, I thought I'd give a succinctness example. Yeah, so where, how do you explain succinctness to the public? Well, at least to the more nerdy public, uh, which is to say, uh, I hope many of you have read, read The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Right? You remember in the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, there's a computer there, it's called Deep Thought, that the people ask it, you know, what's the meaning of life, the universe and everything? And then it says, ooh, it's an interesting question, I have to think about that. And he says, it'll take me seven million years to calculate the answer. So they let it run for seven million years, and the answer is? 42. 42, right. So with a succinct proof, uh, actually Deep Thought could actually prove that it did the calculation correctly and that the answer really is 42. So the verifier doesn't have to run for 7 million years. The verifier can just look at this very short proof and be completely convinced that the answer to life, the universe, and everything really is uh, 42. So easy explanation. <laughs> By the way, I do have to say that um, just this morning I, was, I, gave, I gave this explanation to, to some reporter that I was talking to, and he says, that sounds impossible. How can you possibly verify uh, computation that takes seven million years? How can you possibly verify it in like five milliseconds? It sounds impossible. Can you give an example of how, like a real world example where, where you can easily explain how succinctness works? Succinctness works. Why is it possible? And honestly, this is a challenge for all of you. If you guys can think, Shafi, maybe you have an example. But if you can give a, like a very simple example of why is succinctness possible, uh, I'd, be, I'd be thrilled because it's not easy to give such an example. I think when you talk about solutions to a puzzle, right? The puzzle may take a long time to solve, but verifying solutions are easy. For an NP statement. But this guy knows about NP. Yeah, OK. Uh, okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, perhaps, perhaps. Um, um, anyhow, I thought this was like a, a nice, easy way to explain succinctness. Uh, great. Uh, thanks a lot. Um, so what was the most interesting or uh, unexpected application of zero-knowledge proofs that you've come across? H how long do you have? <laughs> Chaffee, why don't you start? Um, again, this is... Uh, depending on your level, right? So I think the thing that was most surprising is that I heard that the, this thing about the nuclear disarmament, right? So this was uh, quite a few years back. I think Boaz Barak was a, in uh, Princeton then, and there were some physicists in a cafeteria talking about how they can do, let's say the Americans and the Russians at the time, they had nuclear warheads and they want to convince each other that they're actually disarming nuclear warheads, and not just some uh, demi thing that looks like it. So uh, they said, oh, well, maybe you could use a zero knowledge protocol to prove that what you have inside of this warhead actually has nuclear capabilities. And they, of course, this is not digital information, but it's some sort of something about the technology of being a nuclear nor warhead rather than just looking like one. But they came up with a protocol that was actually quite similar in spirit to what we do in zero knowledge. It had something to do with how many electrons were being emitted, and it was sort of accounting and comparing to something that you knew was a nuclear head warhead to things that you weren't sure of and you're trying to prove they were. So that was a surprising use. Uh, people were writing grants about nuclear warheads in nuclear engineering and zero knowledge. And um, that surprised me. But frankly, the big surprise for me was really in 1987, when after we sort of invented the idea of zero knowledge and showed a few examples of it, is that a paper came around that showed that everything in NP can be done in zero knowledge under you know, a one-way function assumption. And that was like going from a, a, a concept and an example to a very general result. It really lacks a little bit the type of zero knowledge, but uh, that was kind of shocking. And from there on, yeah, there was a lot of possibilities. Yeah, there are so many surprising applications. Uh, it's it's even, even really kind of hard to choose. I guess, um, 
you know, there are applications to building signatures with all sorts of properties like blind signatures, homomorphic signatures. It's really kind of cool that recently there's a lot of applications and learning for zero knowledge, right? You want to prove that you actually evaluated a model correctly without revealing anything about the model. So all those, I think, are, are really interesting. Um, I guess uh, there's, uh, we, we did some work on zero knowledge uh, to, to fight disinformation, which I actually talked about at Berkeley before, so I won't say any more about that. Um, if you're interested in seeing how that works, check out the Real World Crypto uh, talk on that. Um, and even, uh, even uh, uh, using zero knowledge to actually prove that a program works correctly. So I can prove to you that a program does, satisfies its spec without ever giving you the source code, which is really kind of, kind of amazing, right? I can I literally just give you the binary uh, along with the proof that the source code satisfies some, some public spec and you won't learn anything other, uh, about, um, about the source code other than what's uh, revealed by the program itself. So there's really uh, endless, endless kind of very surprising applications. Yes, yeah, great, thank you. And uh, again, in the ZKP MOOC, we do uh, actually cover a broad range of different applications. So I do encourage everyone to go check it out uh, as well. Um, so, right, so in the MOOC, we covered a lot of different topics. So what is the one thing that you wish more people knew or understood about zero-knowledge proofs? Okay. <laughs> you go first. I go first. Okay. Um, you know, to me, what's, uh, one thing that um, um, I think it would be nice is if, you know, I believe that kind of words matter and uh, terminology matters a lot. And we see the words ZK being thrown out a lot, even in applications that don't require ZK. So a good example is like a ZK rollup. Well, most ZK rollups actually re rely on succinctness, not so much on ZK. So if I had a magic wand and um, I could wave it, I, I would maybe encourage all of you also, when you name projects, maybe if you're not using ZK, just using succinctness, maybe call it proof-based system or succinct system, and systems that do use ZK, actually use privacy, zero knowledge for privacy, could actually use the terminology. It's kind of funny that ZK rollups use ZK, but a system like Tornado, which actually uses zero knowledge, is not called, doesn't have the words uh, ZK in it. So, yeah. So I would say that um, <coughs> you, you asked uh, what uh, I would wish got more attention. So I think everything has its time. So right now, people are interested in blockchains, interested in succinctness, and uh, willing to uh, assume as much as you can, right, to get a very compact and and a fast uh, to uh, verify proof. But there are things that you can do even unconditionally. So we're making a lot of assumptions, right, to get both soundness and zero knowledge and succinctness and so forth. Uh, if you sort of wanted to kind of step back and say, what can which some of these properties you can get without making any assumptions whatsoever, whereas some of the proper you cannot make no assumptions and get everything. That is both the provability and the zero knowledge and succinctness. But you could do get unconditional, let's say, zero knowledge and not unconditional soundness. I w I think it would be interesting going forward to see f different physical models uh, of doing zero knowledge that would make it unconditional. So if you know uh, a bit sort of, uh, let's say about quantum, which I think you're going to be asking about next, maybe not. So there are some things like key exchanges that we can do unconditionally uh, you know, in, in quantum, where we don't have to assume hardness of things. And I think that there is some of that to be uncovered also for zero knowledge. Uh, once we uh, allow ourselves sort of um, different models going from the kind of paradigm that we're in. Or maybe one day we'll actually prove that some problem is hard. And then, and then, and then these constructions will become. That's going to take more time. That's going to take more time for sure. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, so earlier we talked about uh, some surprising applications. So now, in terms of from the actual uh, technologies or techniques, as an expert uh, in the field, what were the breakthrough results that really surprised you? Mm. Breakthrough results. Actually, Shafi, why don't you start with us? So I guess uh, I mentioned the one, the original one that showed about the generality of, of uh, zero knowledge. I guess another thing is that uh, stuff that's less known, but and it's not necessarily um, just zero knowledge. As, as, as Dan emphasized, there's something about the succinctness or the, or the fact that you can prove a lot of things with very little memory, even without the zero knowledge property. So to me, the development in this field that was very surprising was that um, after starting with this first model, where there's a prover and a verifier, and you can talk about interaction or non-interactive, like uh, SNARKs and so forth. There was this other models where you uh, have these um, two provers, where, 
and, and then you can get unconditional zero knowledge, and that morphed into something called a probabilistically checkable proof, where there's sort of a long proof, but you only have to check a few uh, locations, and still, if there is a mistake anywhere, you'll find a mistake with high probability. And that was sort of a revolution in complexity theory and showed a lot of hardness approximation of, um, of, a, of a lot of problems. So again, it's more of a, of a complexity theory uh, development, but it was very shocking that it came from this zero knowledge proofs that had to do just with trying to hide something while you're convincing someone of a fact. And it turned out that that way where we are allowing probability of error made that we could have much more efficient proofs than we ever thought and locally checkable because we allowed the probability of error. And then in itself kind of re, um, re-described complexity theory. So it came from a very unexpected uh, goal. So you're referring to the, the, PCP, the PCP theorem. Yeah. yeah, actually, I guess it's kind of useful to say that uh, all the uh, snarks that we kind of know and love today. In some sense, they're children and grandchildren of the PCP theorem. That's right. Yeah. Actually, maybe I'll say one more thing about that because I think that is uh, that's that's kind of interesting for for folks to think about. So, if you had to summarize like the one algebraic fact that makes the PCP theorem and snarks work, at least one proof of the PCP theorem, it's kind of remarkable that everything follows really just from the from a very very simple algebraic fact. Yeah, that a polynomial of degree n has only n roots. Yeah, it's really kind of that kind of elementary school algebra, algebra, well, I don't know if elementary, that simple algebraic fact is literally what makes uh, the snarks that we use today uh, work and actually goes back to the, to, the, to the PCP theorem. What's interesting is that is only the original proof of the PCP theorem, right, using algebra <coughs> and polynomials and such. In fact, there's another proof of the PCP theorem, which, is, which doesn't use algebra, which is more combinatorial. Mm -hmm. And it's very interesting, actually, that that so the algebraic proof of the PCP theorem gave rise to all the snarks that we use today. Yeah, the combinatorial proof of the PCP theorem maybe that's like an area that's just waiting to be harvested, right? Maybe there's a whole new direction to snarks that could be uh, constructed just from that proof. So if there are any of you out there that are uh, interested in kind of exploring a whole new direction for building snarks, maybe it's worth learning more about these combinatorial proofs of the PC PCP theorem. Maybe there's a lot more to harvest over there. Maybe, but to me also, I think this is like the victory of algebra, which always is victorious <laughs> over the, in terms of this so such beauty and richness, and and it actually can lead to these amazing things. So yeah, uh, algebra. <laughs> everybody should just, just stop. by the way, this is um, yeah, I think. This is this is by the way a very relevant discussion. Let's uh, let's let's uh, zoom out just a minute, just a little bit. Uh, I don't know if you are aware of this, but in California and in the rest of the country, there's a big discussion of whether algebra should be taught in high school. Yes, very high big discuss in high school. Very big discussions on that. And the fact that if you don't learn algebra, you will not be able to invent uh, snarks. <laughs> I don't know. I would say say maybe that's an argument. Well. Not clear that's going to fly, but that's an argument that we could use that, in fact, more mathematics is definitely me needed in high school. Um, but go coming back for just one second, the thing that surprised, that surprised me. So I guess um, uh, just to give a little bit of the history in that, uh, again, the, 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 the original um, origins of, of SNARKs date back to the PCP theorem and the zero knowledge proofs. Amazing, amazing work. It's interesting that in the early days, Many, much of the work that the prover was doing was, uh, was polynomial time, but it, it wasn't quite linear time, yeah? And in some sense, um, that looked like, you know, where we are. And one thing that's, uh, that was surprising and un uh, somewhat unexpected and actually enabled a lot of what we do today is the fact that in the early 2010s or so, all of a sudden there was a sequence of provers that emerged that were actually linear time or quasi-linear time. And that really is what makes it, makes it possible to do, uh, to do what you know, all this uh, group is actually, is actually doing today. So I just wanted to highlight that, because that, that is kind of an amazing jump that happened about a decade ago. Great, great. Yeah, thank you. Um, so in the past decades, we have seen the efficiency of proofs, uh, I mean, related to what Dan just mentioned. Um, proof systems have improved uh, by orders of magnitude. Uh, I mean, again, that's why that's a big mo motivation for the ZKP MOOC and also all this hackathon and, uh, and so on. And also, I think many of you have heard about uh, the recent like, ZK UVM launches and, uh, and so on. So the question is, where do we go from here? Um, where do you think we still have, you know, <coughs> all just a magnitude efficiency improvements that uh, are down the road? And where do you think these improvements will come from? 
So I, I, I will take, a, I actually was going to say that you should say it, but I, we've just been spending a week uh, in a workshop at Simon's where a big topic is verification. And um, it's surprising there's a lot of new things that are coming up. For example, like batch verification, which is also done in, in uh, you know, in snarks and stuff like that, but in very clever ways of doing this. So sort of like you can do on bulk lots of verification with essentially proportional to one with, uh, witness uh, length. And, and I could see that, that those ideas of batch can be not just for size, but for other things as well. Th that's to me, as a, theor as a theor more theory-oriented person, is where I would look. Um, you know, I, I have to say, I remember this quote from uh, Don, Don Knuth that said that um, uh, he, ho he wishes people would stop writing papers on sorting so he can sort all the work on sorting. Because uh, he was having trouble keeping track of all the work on sorting. This, uh, our field, uh, you know, these uh, ZK proofs, the, uh, both uh, the theoretical directions, the more practical directions, it's incredible to see what's happening. There's this, the community has just grown by so much. Look at how many of you are in the room. You know, 20 years ago, uh, if you had told me that uh, we're going to be building a ZK EVMs, I would have thought, my God, this is like science fiction. Yeah, how many... Just think about that. How many um, examples do we have where 20 years ago we would think that something is science fiction, and 20 years later, not only is it doable, it's actually in production and people use it. I mean, how many examples like that do we have? Not, not that many, right? Oh, well, maybe landing rocket. What? Chat GPT. OK, fine. <laughs> well, yeah, so fine. You got it. Another chat GPT, another, ex another example. Not, OK, we got two examples. Yeah, not that many, as I said. So, but you're asking where, where will the next uh, improvement come from? I, I think there's a lot, of the, a lot of avenues to explore. Of course, there's all the wonderful theoretical avenues that Shafi mentioned. Um, I would say that uh, also recursion and folding schemes have gotten a lot of attention recently. Folding schemes in particular, I guess uh, you guys, some of you already asked me about Nova and Supernova and Hypernova. Those are really interesting uh, directions for folding schemes. So probably there's a, a lot more uh, to do there, and I would guess that that's kind of where um, uh, you know a lot of the next improvements will come from. Yeah, thank you. Um, okay, so follow on that question. Uh, so another uh, right there, uh, dimension is uh, we've seen advancement of quantum computing, and hence it's really important for us to work on uh, post-quantum secure zero knowledge proof uh, approaches. And so the current solutions, they still have large proof size and so on. There's still a lot of room for improvement. So which line of research do you think are most promising to resolve these issues? Post-quantum. Yeah. Shafi, do you want to go first? Or? Um, sure. So again, for one thing, um, I think you're thinking about a particular set of, of proofs uh, when you talk about things that are not post-quantum. But there are, uh, you can do these things also based on lattice-based assumptions, which do seem to be, and hashing functions. And, not, and, and furthermore, I want to emphasize something I said before, that some of the schemes which are, uh, have uh, unconditional uh, zero knowledge and computational soundness, which sa says that it, you will have everlasting secrecy um, even when quantum computers are around because it's unconditional. So if you have aspects of this that are proved unconditionally, and those are the aspects you care about, then those things actually don't uh, are not going to be broken if qu quantum computers are going to be built. But also, I wouldn't be so worried in the near future. <laughs> ah, so Shafi said exactly what I was going to say. That's excellent. So, so um, right. So uh, when it comes to quantum computing, I guess we have to separate between data integrity and data confidentiality, right? So for confidentiality, things that we encrypt today, we can worry about quantum computers 30, 40, 50 years in the future. You know, I, um, uh, all of us actually have to write a lot of recommendation letters, and we have to send the recommendation letters over by email, and they're all encrypted. If somebody's recording all those ciphertexts, you know, even in 30, 40, 50 years from now, uh, if they're decrypted, you know, maybe uh, there'll be some uh, interesting, you know, social aspects to that. Um, I only write good letters, though, so for me it's not a problem. <laughs> um, but so that's an example where confidentiality is something that we might need to worry about uh, in the near future. Integrity is something that we can worry about more where, when, when we get, as we get closer to, to uh, the world of quantum computers, there we just shift to a system that's quantum resistant. And we have actually stark, uh, snarks that are quantum resistant. Starks are an example, right? Hash-based starks, uh, quite practical. Uh, there's a lot of theoretical theory work that's uh, that's quantum resistance. So in some sense, uh, it's it's always I have to say it's a little, a little surprising to me that uh, we get this quantum question as much as we get. Right? It's good that the public is worried and interested in quantum computer, but from a cryptography point of view, more or less we know what to do. Right? We know what to do. 
And so uh, it's like we don't have to freak out if there's like a, a quantum computer that's going to come out soon. We know we know what to do. Although, as I think we agree, it's still uh, still very very far in the future. Absolutely. Great. Thank you. Um, so so earlier the audience already mentioned ChatGPT. So that's of course one. One direction, one area that has seen huge excitement, and uh, the advancement of uh, CKP technologies is another really exciting area. Um, so, in the area of AI, I think people have heard a lot about the discussion, uh, the ethical questions, and uh, uh, right, <laughs> these type of questions to the extent that, um, uh, like, over 1,000, I think now it's maybe even 10,000, uh, right? Like, uh, research scholars have signed a letter um, to say that to actually even call for the pause of uh, AI research, uh, of these large language models uh, in general, this area for six months to figure out how to, to have a better way to, to figure out a better way how the society together can progress in a responsible way. So one question is. Uh, what do you think about in the area of zero knowledge proofs? Do you think there are ethical concerns, implications uh, as well? Uh, right. Yeah, that's a question. I see. Do you want to take that, or do you? Want to well, okay. I, I, it's a surprising question because I think that actually zero knowledge is only adding to the ethics rather than the other way around. Because what are we saying really fundamentally is that you don't have to store secrets, if a, you, and you can still convince someone that you have it, and they can verify it without actually having access to your information. That's even if you look at the most basic example of verifying passwords without actually knowing what your password is. So in, in, in a sense, it seems to me that we are only making the privacy stronger, the burden of uh, people to keep information which they're not good at, uh, you know, it goes away. Um, you know, we are verifying, you could verify the legal contracts, you know, uh, there's somebody's uh, access to information without knowing details about them. So uh, the question surprises me. I, of course, hesitate to say that there are no ethical <laughs> problems, because maybe there's always some ethical problems I haven't thought about. Perhaps there's less ac accountability. So you would say that down the line, maybe it wasn't a good thing that you let someone prove with high probability that there, uh, maybe uh, without giving you the evidence because there is some merit to having some way to account for it. You know, if there are no random coins in the world, like we're assuming that there are, randomness is out there. Maybe it's not true. Maybe everything is deterministic. Maybe we are making people think that something is true and it's not the case and, 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 and therefore uh, there's some potential for misuse. I can't think of anything else. Well, um, so pr privacy that's enabled by, by ZK, you know, I, I think there are there are ethical aspects to it. Okay. Um, and so, I learned something from this. Uh, wow, great, uh, great, chat. great. Yeah, okay. maybe maybe just to give one example, um, uh, something that often is brought up by law enforcement, right? So imagine, so as we know, ZK it's proofs. Accountability. Yeah. Well, ZK, ZK proofs are used to provide uh, privacy, complete privacy, in the payment system, right? There are many blockchains that use ZK proofs to, uh, to pr enable anonymous payments, private payments. Um, well, as you know, there are folks in law enforcement that have problems with completely private payments where there's nothing we can do. Um, and I guess we've seen an example, Tornado Cash was an example that was actually shut down because it was fully private and uh, therefore it was actually abused and therefore was not allowed to, uh, to, uh, to operate. I think the, uh, the answer to us is, you know, we live in the real world, right? I mean, there are laws that we have to comply with. Um, um, it's not always clear when, we, when you talk about the global internet, it's not always clear which jurisdiction's laws you need to comply with. But let's say we are focused on the US, you know, there are obviously we have to comply with, with US laws. And so I think when you, when you mention uh, ethics, I think the question is, the challenge to technologists is how do we design systems that provide the best level of privacy while complying with uh, you know, the laws of the US, which is you know, it's just, a, it's just a fact. We have to comply with the laws of the US. Um, and so that, that actually is, uh, it, it actually makes the technical problem uh, technically more difficult, more challenging, more difficult. Uh, and so, yeah, it's, we, we actually don't know what the solution is. We don't know where things are going to go. And it's quite, this is a pretty, a pretty interesting time. It's kind of an area where there needs to be a lot of conversation between cryptographers and lawyers 
um, we've actually written the paper with lawyers on you know what does it mean to do to do uh, I mean how, how do we how do we reconcile this this issue uh, for a need for private privacy in some systems with a need to uh, to comply with laws so uh, yeah I think it's a pretty interesting topic so uh, I get you I would say that a difference between this and ChatGPT I mean there's difference because these are different things and they're different ethical questions but the difference is that uh, I think that zero knowledge was founded and continues to be grounded in in uh, like you know the sentence in math we trust we actually prove the things that we and we can uh, uh, define clearly what it is that we are guaranteeing okay we're saying this is what we guarantee we can prove it maybe under some assumptions but it's very explicit right now to me the issue with uh, these uh, large language models and so forth is that we don't they they're not very c clear about what they provide and what they don't provide where are the limits uh, because every, you know it's so beautiful it's so amazing you can do more and more and more so there's no not clear how it generalizes not clear if it's robust not clear exactly what you're gu guaranteeing and that's where I think there's a lot of worry where is this going you know, if it was very clear what you're providing, what you're not providing, maybe then you could curtail it. That is actually, because the nature of our field and where it comes from, uh, it's, it's, you know, it is very much grounded in a clear definitions and, and fairly clear um, what we provide. And I think there's a difference there. So we can discuss the ethics of what we, whether, but at least we know what we're providing, what we're not providing. Sure, for trustworthiness. Yeah, I think that there's lots of. Uh, the question is whether whether ZK can help uh, ChatGPT uh, provide more account, more uh, guarantee, robustness and guarantees of the results. Yeah, I think that's a great uh, field, and uh, obviously people are working on it. I think all these methods of verification and trying to figure out consistency and things of that sort, which is in the nature of of what we do, are extremely applicable. Of course, if. if the problem again is you can't really formalize what they're doing. If you could formalize what they're doing, you could use our methods to show yeah. whether they achieve it or don't achieve it. So still, the key challenge is to formalize what is it that is being done there, and it's a fascinating question. So f first of all, this uh, this conversation proves uh, a theorem that every convers technology conversation these days within 20 minutes converges to ChatGPT. Ja <laughs> um, very exciting. It's a very it is very exciting. I agree. Um, and there, but and also just to recognize the limits of what crypto can do. You know, I ask ChatGPT simple questions, and it very confidently gives me wrong answers. <laughs> right? There is. Th it's not clear that uh, us cryptographers can actually help with that. That's more of a question for people who are. Who are who are uh, training the models, uh, but uh, to Shafi's point, actually, the the field, the crypto field we're in, is a very very precise field. Yeah, it's very important to remember the state. All the statements we make, everything is very 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 uh, precise. It's kind of a mathema very mathematical field in that sense. Um, everything that we guarantee is is um, you know comes with a, a very strong degree of precision, so you can tell exactly what's guaranteed and what's not guaranteed. And the the I think the challenge is then. Uh, to policymakers, in some sense, the message to, that we always give is: you tell us what the policy is, should be, we can come up with efficient zero knowledge proofs to implement that policy. What should the policy be? And then we get blank stares from the other side, right? And so the challenge is actually, you know, what exactly? Right? What well, is the policy? Can, but people can. But there is this course between. Uh, uh, there, there are discussions between policymakers. Let's say in GDPR, there was all these examples where they say roughly what they want. You know, they want it to be. A, a, you can sort of delete your information. You want. You want people not to be um, singled out and so forth. So it is partially on us to define that in precise terms and say, if you define it like this, we can provide it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think the, the the bottom line, I think, is that there's room for a lot more dialogue between our community and the policy maker uh, making community. And so, you know, please be open to that, right? So this is a message to all of you, please be open to that. I think it makes a lot of sense to, to, fo to talk to the folks in DC first to explain what zero knowledge can do. It's because it's, it's a magical thing, right? If I just a told you off the bat that this is, po that, you know, how can this be done? You would think that this is impossible. So first explain what the technology can do, and second of all, you know, work together on what is it that we should actually, uh, what policies should we be enforcing? Great, great. A quick follow-up: Is a zero knowledge proof uh, deterministic or is it probabilistic? So we can say for sure that ah. okay. There, there's a there's a
the probability associated? Yeah, the question is, is, is it, okay, yeah, the question is, is, is um, does it get, give absolute guarantees or does it, or does it give probabilistic guarantees? And so everything right, here is with high probability, but it's so high when we say like one in the lifetime of the universe. So let's put it this way, you know, the chance that you will find a mistake uh, is uh, maybe you could when the universe ceases to exist. So uh, that's sort of good enough. Yeah, the probability of error is so low that it's the same as you just randomly guessing a cryptographic key. Like, you know, you're so lucky that you ended up just guessing a random key and that happens to be like a decryption key. So that's so unlikely that we say it will never happen. We have questions in the back. Yes. But parallelistic with a, such a it's low a, it's error. A non -zero, it's a non-zero error. But yeah. such a low error probability that you might as well. Oh, no, that's okay. It's parallelistic. Yeah. Parallelistic. Um, so, 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 we'll, so maybe we'll just uh, uh, have another one or two questions, and then we'll open up to the floor just for uh, yeah. a few questions. Right? OK, so, uh, so we have a lot of uh, right, newcomers in the ZKP MOOC and uh, in the field and so on. Uh, so well, what would be your advice to someone just starting out in this area? Um, first of all, first of all, take, take, take yeah. the ZK, ZK MOOC. That's, yeah. that's step number one. ZK, <laughs> take, take, the Z, take the ZK MOOC. Uh, I, I have to say there, this, this area is, um, it's, it's really, uh, uh, I'm thrilled to see that there are people who are coming in who are not trained cryptographically and they're able to pick up the topic and kind of self-study and learn by themselves and come to, uh, to the forefront of the space. So it's really, it's really wonderful to see that. So um, I, I think the main message is, don't be afraid. Yeah, I mean, nothing is too complicated for you to understand. It's all it's all understandable. There are very good tutorials out there in the zk MOOC in particular. Um, if you have questions and you want to join like a group that studies this topic as a whole, there's a zk study club. Just Google that, the zk study club. That's a wonderful resource to join. It's kind of a group of people from all over the world. It's open to to answering questions and um, another way to uh, to uh, come up to speed. And then there are actually textbooks that are appearing in the, on, on the subject. So Justin Taylor has a very good uh, text textbook. You can take a look at that. And so there are more uh, resources that are coming up. But of course, start with the zk MOOC. <laughs> I, I, it's just a generic question. When somebody asks me, what advice would you give? I think it's like precision medicine, you know? Depends on, on what your ailment is <laughs> so, or what your taste is. So if I have, I have had many, many students over my career, and you cannot really have the same advice to two different students. You have to find out what, they, what their strong talent is, what they're interested in, and then maybe if you have the right intuition as, a, as, an, as, a, as an advisor or as a teacher, you could tell what is it that's going to, what they're going to do well, what is going to spark their interest. It's too generic a question. Uh, it's like, you know, you've all seen The Graduate probably, yeah. you know, where he says what you should do and you should go into plastics. Uh, <laughs> it's, a, it's kind of a joke, right? Uh -huh. <coughs> uh, okay, um, one last question, then we'll open up to the floor uh, for a little bit. Um, so, right, what is the biggest challenge in the space that, uh, at the moment, according to you, and what would you want to see happen in the space in the next 10 years? Okay, uh, you know, I'm going to take that and zoom out a little bit. I'm going to interpret that as a question of about cryptography in general. Where is cryptography going? What's the biggest challenge? You know, so uh, this is an amazing time to be a cryptographer. We were just talking about this before before the panel. Uh, I don't remember. I've, I've been doing this a long time. Um, I have to tell you, the last five years have been amazing. Like, uh, this is an amazing, amazing time to be a cryptographer. There are so many interesting problems to work on. There is so much interest. Uh, there are so many new ideas. The community is growing. So many papers being written. Uh, but still, there's a lot of, a lot of uh, work that needs to be done in cryptography. Maybe I'll give uh, three examples. You know, literally, um, I'll start with uh, fully homomorphic encryption. Yeah, if we had a fully homomorphic encryption system that was, say, five times slower, only five times slower than computing on plain text, it would change the world. Like, I mean, there are so many industries that are literally waiting for fast, efficient, fully homomorphic encryption. It would just enable us to do things that we can't even dream of today. Uh, and, you know, you might say, oh my God, that's never going to happen. But that's just not true. Yeah, I mean, fast, fully homomorphic encryption, like five times slower than computing on plain text. It literally could be like one idea away. Right? We have fully homomorphic encryption. Right now, it's a lot slower than computing on plain text. Maybe one idea will enable us to uh, speed it up, and then we'll, we'll be there. So uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful area to work on. And there are lots of problems like that. I, I'll give another example. 
there's a uh, again an incredible tool that's been developed in crypto in the last two decades. It's called obfuscation. Maybe maybe many of you have heard of it in distinguishability obfuscation in particular. Today it's extremely inefficient, but there are again industries that are waiting for indistinguishability obfuscation. And just to give you one example, it would allow us to store secrets on the blockchain, which today we cannot do. Right, the blockchain today cannot keep secrets. Without secret keys in particular. With obfuscation, we could do it. So literally, there's a whole industry waiting for us to come with efficient indistinguishability obfuscation. And again, it's one of these things where you say, oh my God, that's never going to happen. Well, no, that's not true. We might be just one idea away from coming up with an efficient, uh, with an efficient construction. So it's like everywhere you look. Um, and I could keep on rattling these problems, right? Witness, witness encryption, an incredible tool. Again, extremely useful on the blockchain. We can't use it today because we don't have efficient instantiations. Again, one idea maybe would get us to efficient uh, witness encryption. So our field is just littered with all these problems that we would love, you know, the industry is waiting for us to come up with solutions for, uh, where we're just, in some sense, you know, we are not delivering, right? The industry is waiting and we're not coming up with, uh, with good enough solutions. But, you know, maybe it's all just one idea away and one, maybe one of you will have that idea. So I'm, I, I foresee a really rosy future for cryptography. I think this area never gets boring. Yeah, I mean, it looks like sometimes, oh, you know, oh my God, so, so many of the problems have been solved and all of a sudden there are a whole new uh, category of problems. This area never, ever, ever gets boring. So I'm really happy to see so many of you here and I really encourage you to keep studying more and more cryptography because it's one of those uh, rabbit holes that goes uh, to infinite depth. Yeah, great answer. Um, I think there's a difference between obfuscation and homomorphic encryption uh, in the sense of how much time it will get there to uh, level of efficiency because if with FHE we've, it was pretty amazing what it was like in 2008 versus what it's like today so it's not five times uh, without being encrypted but it's way better than it was and for certain tasks it's even fast enough um, obfuscation is still I think several ideas away rather than one um, but as you mentioned, there, there's these amazing gadgets that people have defined in crypto and have shown that in principle they're doable, like witness encryption or something called functional encryption, that if you have, you have se separate keys, go to separate people, and if you have a key, then you can compute certain function on a, of the underlying message, but not others. There's like a lot of stratification of things that you can do. And, um, and it is true that it, the difference between defining them and actually using them is in some breakthrough. It's going to make this uh, efficient. Um, you know, and in general, I do think that the combination between machine learning and cryptography has a huge uh, future to it. A, you know, doing all these operations on encrypted uh, data, when selectively encrypted, maybe some stuff is encrypted, sometimes isn't, you know, being able to combine very, very large data sets to be able to make much more progress about things which are important to us, you know, understanding, medicine, and so forth. I think there is a barrier there, the privacy barrier, that doesn't let us use uh, the kind of ML tools that we could to the extent that, that, that would be wonderful to do. And if we could combine those two things together, there's really a lot more than we can do. Uh, thanks. So now we, uh, so we do want to get back to our demo and uh, award, uh, but we want to just take uh, a few minutes to maybe, uh, right, so I think there were a few hands uh, from, right, please. Mm -hmm. The unconditional that I that the, the result that I, what I was so uh, the question was you met that I mentioned that there's something called unconditional zero knowledge and the question was uh, is that about the privacy or about the soundness I think that's what your question is and what I was think you could go either way but the one that I was referring to is where there's a, the soundness depends on a computational assumption but uh, the zero the zero knowledge does not depend on a computational assumption and the reason I mentioned it in the context of quantum so if you want something you want to check something now with respect to the ability of breaking soundness you can't do it right now but Maybe later you will be able to break that assumption, but the, the, the zero knowledge is going to be maintained because it's unconditional. So we don't know. We can't do both. So we're giving up somewhere, either in the uh, zero knowledge or in the soundness, or we are throwing into the mix some sort of a physical assumption, like the provers are separate from each other, or there's a speed of light, or something like that. You know, and so they can't talk to each other.
hardness and what is retractability and one-way functions. And then there's a super practical set of how you can plug in like detaining system ways like bridges or like the EDM. And then there's like a middle ground of like making new polynomial commitment schemes. I'm really curious, like obviously we can't focus on all of them, even though like different people are focusing on all of them. Is there any place on that spectrum that you all think right now is the time to like really hone in on and you find that you'll get the most utility out of focusing there, there's no unique answer to this. It really depends. I think it really, it really depends on what, we're, yeah, what precision medicine. Yeah, it really depends on what your interests are. I, I would say if you're, um, so if you're interested, for example, in in minimizing assumptions, right? Then yeah, there's a huge community in the on the theory side working on how to build proof systems with the least possible assumptions. Beautiful, beautiful ideas is coming up there. So that would be one direction. If you're if you're a systems person, you're interested in designing programming languages um, that are especially well suited for uh, for snarks. Uh, it's actually it's it's kind of remarkable that uh, when you see the work that's being done on very on the, on the snark frameworks, it has a lot of uh, hardware design flavor, right? Because a lot of them are basically designing. Um, in some sense, virtual machines that run on this, on this SNARK hardware. And the SNARK hardware is not like anything the VLSI people build. Yeah, it's very different hardware. Things that are expensive on one side is cheap on the other side and vice versa. So all of a sudden, there's a lot of uh, design work in how do you actually design the most efficient virtual machine that's uh, appropriate for the, for the SNARK hardware. So if you like that kind of work, there's a tremendous amount of progress happening there. And even in the middle ground, like you mentioned, um, Designing uh, snark systems, designing like I, I call this above the hood and under the hood. Yeah, above the hood is basically just using snarks as a black box, and under the hood is kind of opening the black box and designing better snarks. There's also tremendous progress happening uh, in that area as well. So it really, I mean, this is like why this area is so amazing. It's like there's there's like anyone can everyone can contribute. Right. If you're a systems person, you go one one side. If you if you love math, you go to the middle. If you like like more of the complexity theoretical stuff, uh, theoretical type of work, you go to the to the minimizing assumptions. So there's like amazing stuff for everyone to contribute. So I wish I had a precise answer for you, but that's the best answer there I can give. Oh, you go, you sure, go. sure. So the, the question is, what are the bottlenecks to more, uh, to greater adoption? Um, you know, honestly, the, 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 the fact that today, if you're a company that's trying to deploy snarks, you need to hire cryptographers. Yeah, that's, that's not where we want to be, right? We, where we want to get to is if you're a company or a project that's trying to use snarks, you should be able to use off-the-shelf tools and not, you sh not shoot yourself in the foot. I think that's the end goal. That's the end vision. Now, we are making progress towards going there. Yeah, there are uh, companies that make it possible to now take just regular C code, compile it, run it through their compiler, and poof, you have a snark system that proves that the code ran correctly. So that starts to minimize the requirements on developers that developers needs to know, need to know in order to use, uh, to use this technology. Uh, we're not there yet. Yeah, these tools are still in their infancy. They're still not that easy to use. Uh, you still need to be a cryptographer, honestly, uh, to use them correctly, and so this is uh, this is you, you, this is um, sort of an engineering effort, but it's a very important engineering effort, right? Making it uh, as accessible and as easy for developers to use the technology is is uh, kind of what's going to unlock basically you know universal adoption of the technology. So I, I, I'll answer your question uh, in a different way because I'm not sure um, whether that's what you were looking for, but so I. I um, could take your question differently. Say, what what is the bottleneck? Why isn't everybody doing like this fancy crypto? Why isn't everybody doing zero knowledge? Why isn't it the case that companies who are doing, you know, really um, FHE or MPC or zero knowledge uh, are not, you know, it's not the next Apple or Google yet, right? And the reason I think is because um, there isn't yet, we haven't 
convinced people, or maybe we haven't found it ourselves, to be too completely honest, a, of a, an application that cannot, a use case that cannot be done differently. A use case where it's very clear that if you do this, you can, let's say, maybe hit a market that you wouldn't be able to do otherwise. And that's why I gave the example of, um, of a, uh, an AI type of application where there's a lot of documents, there's a lot of data you're just not gonna have access to unless you use crypto. But by having access to it, you could get so much more utility. So that might be something where you just can't do it because you're not gonna have the access, so you're not gonna be, be able to get the utility. But I would think that that's what's you know, convincing that you really are gonna go elsewhere with the crypto rather than just protecting yourself or being more efficient is, in my mind, what we haven't gotten yet. But um, I, I don't know, there. but we're almost there. So, so um, my uh, co-patriots here are much more uh, yeah, practical obviously. and optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> indeed, uh, indeed. No, we will get there. Yeah. But I think that that's what's missing today. Uh, great, I know we have uh, you know, lots more questions, but we do want to get back to our uh, the finalist demos and awards uh, sessions. So thanks a lot. Uh, yeah. Thanks again, Chef and Dan, um, for the really wonderful discussion. So, so next, we are going to uh, do the ZK Circuits track. Um, so ZK Circuit track, the goal is to develop, to get the community together to develop efficient uh, circuits and protocols uh, for common um, applications and computations uh, right in the ZKP applications. And there are several categories uh, in the ZK Circuits track. Um, so now we are going to show the finalist demos. We implemented the SHA-2 and Ketsak families of hash functions in CIRCOM. An effort was made to optimize the number of R1CS constraints, but optimization opportunities seem to be limited. All the standardized 224-bit, 256-bit, 384-bit, and 512-bit variations are implemented for all of SHA-2, Ketsak, and SHA-3, and the SHA-3 extendable output functions too. Several different APIs are available. The resulting hash functions are tested against a few example test vectors. The resulting set of R1CS constraints are about 13% smaller than the SHA-2 implementation in CIRCOMLib, and about 5% smaller than a Ketsak implementation we found on the internet. SHA-2 is built from the following building blocks, operating on 32-bit words, rotations, right shifts, exclusive or majority of three bits, if then else, modular additions. Ketsak is built from the following building blocks, operating on a 5 by 5 by 64 bit array, exclusive or a fixed permutation and a single nonlinear function using binary and. There is some remaining work to do, for example, more exhaustive testing. Thanks for attention. Hi everyone, my name is Yusuf Al Husni. Uh, I recently completed my PhD in cryptography at Ecole Polytechnique in Paris, and I'm now working at, as a cryptographer at Consensus. Uh, so I participated in the ZKP with Free Hackathon in the name of Swell Dua team. Um, I participated in the ZK Circuit track, uh, for which I submitted circuits for tasks for category one tasks uh, 1.3 and 1.4, and category two uh, for task uh, 2.1. Um, so I used GNARK, uh, ZK SNARK library, which is written in Go. And for this, uh, I, if I can sum up my contributions to this circuit, they were mainly about pre-computations. So pre-computation for scalar multiplication in the case of ECDSA signatures and pre-computations for pairings in the case of the second argument in the pairing is fixed, which happens for one of the variants of BLS signatures. Uh, the other contribution was mainly for uh, implementing Briegeois uh, additions, unified additions. Um, and also in the pairing, I did the final exponentiation explicitly using torus-based arithmetic, which is basically for 
BN254 and BLS12381. We do not do the computation in FP12, but rather, but rather in FP6. So this divided the number of constraints by mostly uh, 6. We also have other uh, techniques to optimize that I described in the readme. Thanks. Hello, welcome to our submission, SHA-256 in Circum. In our submission, we write some circum codes to instantiate operations in SHA-256 to get a ZKP circuit. The left-hand side is our naive solution to ensure the correctness of implementation, while the right-hand side is some optimizations to reduce the number of R1CS constraints. Compared to the state-of-the-art work XJSNARC, the number of constraints in our implementation is much fewer. In addition, when we remove some constraints, the total number of constraints for each compression is only 16,000. However, it violates the soundness as the necessary bits are not constraints. Now moving on to the next category, Blake 2F hash function. So here is our circuit design. We have breaked into three parts. The first one, we have to initialize the scheduler. And the second part is the compression round. We have four sub rounds for each round. The last one is final XOR. So here's a slide for overall cost. We have 256 rows per round and a, a total of 3,409 rows. And the table has six columns and the lookup table has two to the power of 16 rows. So that's pretty much everything for uh, our presentation. And if you want more details, please refer to the readme file on our GitHub. Thank you so much for your attention. Hello everyone, my name is Varun. I'm a master student at Indian Institute of Technology, Bombay. And this is a short presentation on my hackathon submission, NOAA-based SHA-512 using Bellperson. The submission contains two repositories. The first one is Bellperson SHA-512. The motivation to use Bellperson is that implementation of NOAA accepts Bellperson gadget as a step circuit. This repository contains the circuit for SHA-512 hash function the compression function and circuit representation of U64. The key result here is that the total number of constraints for SHA-512 compression function are 67,123. The second repository is DOA SHA-512. This repository contains the implementation of SHA-512 compression function as a NOVA step circuit and benchmarking details of SHA-512 hash function. It contains details regarding prover time verification time proof sizes for varying message lengths. All the repositories are public. Uh, looking forward to your feedback on my submission. Thank you. Hi everyone, we are team ZK in ZK and our work is implementing SHA-256 in Halo 2. The design of this hash function is based on an existing implementation from Zcash. In SHA-256, we need to append message in some format and fill each chunk into the hashing process, which can be split into message scaling compression subregions or phases. Let's take message scale scheduling for a brief insight. This phase expands each chunk to 2048 bits. For a new 32 bits value W, it is computed by this piece of code. For this two sigma functions, S0 and S1, we rely on a bitwise operation that spreads each value to be double of its original size by adding zero before each bit. On top, I give a simple example of it, and this can also be done by this piece of code here. Now it looks like we're complicating everything up, but lookup table solves it easily. It serves like a black box that accepts certain range of values and generate a constant response. The magic of this spreading technique is that through different operations like shifting and adding of its even or odd bits, we can obtain a variety of bitwise operations like the sigma functions and other bitwise functions in the compression phase. Once we know how to define those bitwide operations, SHA-256 is done, and this can be applied to the other two hashing functions. To summarize what I learned and I did in the experience, on top of this Zcash design, we found that there are constraints, especially copy constraints, missing in this documentation. We haven't checked the actual implementation by them, but I think it is necessary to add those in. The entire process for circuit generation and verification cost more than a minute, and I think that's one of the reasons why people are looking for Zcash-friendly hash. Later on, I hope I can finish up the rest of two functions and, I ex and to explore the other models like Plunky2 to do similar practice. This will conclude our presentation and thanks for listening. Hello everyone. Mm. In this GKP V3 hackathon period, I worked on um, GK Circuit Track Category 4. Uh, it is circuit development using Halo 2C library. So the goal of project is to implement and improve the 
ZK circuit of the right primitive one six testing function using Halo 2C library. So um, the source code can be found uh, in the GitHub. Um, and um, uh, this implementation um, has two branches, I mean two versions. So the main, main branch includes the optimized version and the other branch uh, has the uh, less optimized but uh, good for understanding version. So um, in the optimized version, um, I try to decrease the number of columns uh, used in the circuit and succeeded to decrease two columns. Um, and um, the the improvements uh, of the decreasing two columns can be seen um, in this data. Uh, this is the benchmarking data. And we can see that um, there is a significant improvement in the proof generation time by decreasing only two columns. Uh, I mean, saving six seconds uh, in proof generation time. So thankfully, um, the score team, they provided the template repository and the test case and the benchmarking code. So uh, by uh, simply running the unit test and the benchmarking, um, we can test uh, the correctness and integrity of the implementation. And yeah, uh, the test passes. So uh, at least uh, it's working as expected. Thanks. Okay, great. So the uh, so the finalists for this track, uh, they are uh, several categories. So first for, for category one, circuits for I want to yes. We have a uh, four horn, um, as a uh, actually two uh, co uh, first place four horn uh, with the price of five hundred dollars and uh, Kunya Academy circuits uh, with um, uh, right, with price amount of five hundred dollars as well. And we have category two circuits for recursion uh, with the uh, Sua three. Doha, uh, <laughs> with the price of four thousand uh, dollars, they actually did uh, really good work uh, in the space, and uh, also uh, Varun uh, with the second place with a thousand dollars in this uh, uh, right in this track uh, and, and in this category. And these are sponsor these uh, prizes are sponsored by Jump Crypto. Yeah, I can just do a louder talk. Mm -hmm. uh, hi, Daniel. You should be able to speak. We have the slides uh, in the room, so you can just start. Hi, hopefully you can hear me. Yeah, yeah we can hear you. OK, great. Cool. Well, Scroll has been super pleased to collaborate on the ZK MOOC and ZKP Hackathon. Uh, for the circuits track, we really um, were super impressed with submissions. Uh, we asked people to write circuits in Halo 2 CE for some of the hashing functions that are used by Ethereum precompiles. Uh, this is not a trivial or easy task. And so um, we were super excited uh, that we had some great submissions. And we we're pleased to announce that the prize of $15,000 will be split evenly between Two winning projects. One is the GRD team, who built a working implementation of RIPEMD160, and the Zero Knowledge in Zero Knowledge team, who built an implementation of the SHA-256 circuit adapted from the Zcash gadget. So uh, the teams have done super impressive work, and our team is super excited to see all the amazing ZKP developers that have been emerging from this hackathon. So thanks to everyone who has contributed to make it happen. Uh, great, thanks. And again, for people who are standing in the back, so there are some uh, seats in front if you um, want to uh, move forward. Um, OK, so next uh, we uh, combined two tracks together uh, to show the videos. So these two tracks are, the first one is a sponsored track uh, by Near DevGov, uh, writing zero-knowledge apps with the Snarky GS from O1 Labs. 
Uh, so that's one track, uh, the sponsor track. And another track is the ZK Applications track, uh, which has a number of categories, uh, in particular had a number of sponsor categories um, from different sponsors that we will actually see. Um, Hello everyone. In this project, we implement a simple private voting ZK app. The key idea was to try to implement a single stage private voting. So single stage, like the one we have on let's say Twitter, where the voters can just select an option and be done with the voting, as opposed to um, projects like Minotaur where the voters first need to register with the protocol by submitting some sort of randomness and then use that randomness to show that they have not voted before. Um, in, our, in our project, this um, role of randomness is taken over by the hash of the private key, which allows us to make the whole thing a single stage voting program. The actual ZK app contract is really simple. There are only three functions, um, one being the init function, the other one being the init state function, and the last one being the vote function. The best way to understand this project and these functions is to run the main.ts file, which calls all these functions and shows the state changes corresponding to each of them. Thank you. This is Yeet. Uh, I'm an undergrad studying computer science. Hi, I'm Evan. I'm also an undergraduate studying computer science. So uh, for this hackathon, we wanted to do a project using Elio. More specifically, we implemented a mini version of Stratego with a crypto company theme. Mm. So I wanted to quickly go over the game. Here's an example. So we first uh, start by committing to the boards and we make moves one by one. As you can see, you can see the, uh, the pieces moving and after every move, they prove that the move is valid. And in case of an attack, which is happening right now, they both need to reveal what the value of their pieces are, and then they update their uh, boards accordingly. And then the game continues until uh, someone captures the other's flag. And you can see the game continuing. We had another proof of strength series. And here's an example of the code. We have the update state uh, function, which is for uh, making a move and then proving that your move is valid. and committing to a new hash. Reveal piece reveals a certain uh, position, you know, tells you what the strength of the piece is and commit board tells you uh, the hash of the
came in the execution was reaching by first can go after pieces are interested in computer science and after every move they prove that the move is valid and in case of an attack which is happening right now they both need to reveal what the value of their pieces are and then they update their uh, boards accordingly and then the game continues until uh, someone captures the other's flag and you can see the game continuing we had another proof of strength series and here's a example of the code we have the update state uh, function which is for uh, making a move and then proving that your move is valid and committing to a new hash reveal piece reveals a certain uh, position, you know, tells you what the strength of the piece is, and commit board tells you uh, the hash of the committed value. And here's a very small description of each piece that you can find on the README. Each of them, each of the pieces have their own strengths, and README explains all of it. Hi everyone, welcome to the presentation of Combination Logbox. If you guys are familiar with Mastermind or Hit and Blue, the game is very similar. It has been written in Leo language and has been deployed to the ALEO testnet. Users can go through GitHub README to learn more about the implementation as well as running it locally. But we wanted to turn this into an actual playable fun game. So we created a full stack application using the Leo wallet. To start playing, you can connect the wallet and sign a message. This shows your availability. To create a challenge, you set a three-digit secret that the opponent tries to crack. This is an alien transaction that creates a new record in the ownership of the opponent. The opponent is then able to decrypt the records and accept challenges. To accept the challenge, they also set the secret for the challenger to crack. Once both players have set the challenges, they can start making guesses. However, to reveal the hits and blows for the guesses, they have to collect all the digits that have been scattered in the mills. This has been done because creating challenges on ALU takes a considerable amount of time. Since ours is a two-player turn-based game, we have to wait for not only our transaction to complete, but also wait for our opponent's transaction to complete. So while the transactions happen in the background, we want our users to still be engaged in the game. So we have introduced the concept of maze in the front end. The idea is that by the time the user has collected the items in the maze, both his transactions and that the opponent's transaction is completed. So the player collects the digits and reveals the hints. If a player gets 3 hits, they win, else they try again. Hello everyone, we are Kneo Academy App. In this video, we are going to show you two unchained games with randomness in Aleo. As we know, online games with randomness such as Blackjack, Layer, Death are very interesting, and they are a huge part in the online gaming market. Our interest here is how to play those games in Aleo. In particular, we are at exploring this possibility in Aleo. To extend the scope of Aleo's application, the main challenge here are how to gather a trustworthy random number that all players can verify it and no one can cheat, and how to design games operation by using Leo. Leo is the programming language for Aleo's application. This is actually quite limited because there are less functions that we can use in Leo, and how to design UI and integrate UI with Unchain game to better serve for web-based user. Our idea here is first we use a pair of records states to get the random number. A random number can be generated when a pair of records are signed by two players. Second, we use a global data structure to define game's execution. Last, we use JavaScript to design the interface to link web-based users and blockchain. As you can see, each web-based player is able to use this UI to initialize the game with another player, and the players just need to click the button in the web page. Their actions will be automatically processed and sent to the blockchain. In the last phase, the random number will be published to the blockchain, and everyone can verify whether the random number was generated correctly, and the game's execution was correct. This is a short demonstration of blackjack in Aleo. We also have a simple UI for layer dice. Thank you for your attention. Presenting the game of Zenit. Zenit is an ancient Egyptian board game dating back to around 3000 BCE. Played by two players, it features a rectangular board with 30 squares arranged in three rows of 10. Each player has five pawns, which they move across the board based on the roll of dice. The goal is to be the first to move all pawns off the board, symbolizing the soul's journey through the afterlife. In our adaptation, we retain the core elements of the traditional game while introducing an innovative feature of invisible pieces. To maintain the privacy of these concealed pieces' positions, we employ a zero-knowledge proof system, ensuring a secure and engaging gameplay experience. In terms of implementation, we use two distinct record types, the board record, which keeps track of the board's current state, and the invisible pieces record, responsible for securely storing the positions of each player's concealed pieces. In this diagram, you can see that the board record's ownership alternates between players, reflecting the current turn in play. Conversely, the invisible pieces records always remain with their respective players, ensuring secure handling of the invisible pieces' positions. In this sample gameplay, player 1 rolls a 3, moving from cell 9 to 12. Player 2 rolls a 2, swapping pieces on cells 10 and 12. Player 1 rolls a 2, advancing from cell 7 to 9. Player 2 attempts an invalid move with a protected piece, then corrects by moving from cell 12 to 15, turning their piece invisible. Player 1 moves from cell 10 to 15, also turning invisible. Lastly, player 1 rolls a 3 and moves their invisible piece to cell 18.
Our project is Credmancer, secure, verifiable credentials and collaboration for the ZK Application Track mobile app. The problem area that we focus on is difficulty in hiring talent, silo decentralized organizations, and lack of transparency and payment. Our, our solution would offer members credentials, gig marketplace and completion credentials, and secure payments allocation. We chose DAOs because there's an increasing number of DAOs in the ecosystem with a substantial amount of treasury, but very low active contributors. Zero knowledge proof tech is key to ensuring personal data remains private and also for improving efficiency and speed by using layer two solutions. We created three main contracts to facilitate credential issuing and quest flow. We deployed both on Celo and ZKC Ferris. First is organization controller. It manages organization creation, admin handling. It also stores some basic information, like the organization name, image, file location. Then we have the quest controller, where the organization admins can create quests using the quest method. Then freelancers can apply to the quest, freelancers can apply to the quest, so organization admins can be able to add different payment and additional. Hello from Team IoT Nexus. Our goal is to enhance IoT devices' adaption to blockchain technologies. The current IoT systems data packets work well with Web2 infrastructure, but they struggle with VMs and blockchains. We propose utilizing compact certificates and succinct proofs for efficient blockchain state proof exports. We can we then can enable the creation of custom VMs for blockchains. Compact certificates, as presented by Macaulay, offer three key advantages. They allow for a large number of testers, accelerate verification times by 3,000, and create certificates 400 times smaller than traditional ones when a million testers are present. Algorand presently uses compact certificates for state proofs. Our system, as detailed in our white paper, includes light clients, separate full notes, and a procedure for creating, verifying, and submitting compact certificates to the blockchain. We'll now discuss our project specifics highlighted in the red box. The CC creation involves setting a weight threshold for the vote, initializing gathering votes till the threshold is met, and committing to the attester's weight in a ground truth Merkle tree and the signed message's weight in a vote Merkle tree. After that, we create a mapping that we will deal with in the verification. Verif verification requires checking the threshold, validity of Merkle pass, voter public keys, and coin mappings. For a detailed procedure, prefer refer to the original paper. In our demo, we set validators and a message and show the certificate proof in attesters. Note that the verification time remains low in milliseconds. This is in line with the paper's findings. Our project paves the way for custom VMs for IoT devices, thereby facilitating blockchain adoption. Other applications include on-chain asynchronous voting, cross-chain verifiable weighted votes, and enabling large numbers of attesters in on-chain voting. Thank you for your attention. For more details, check out our GitHub for technical documentation, code, and white paper. Our team appreciates your time. Hello, everybody. My name is Abhi Kumar. Uh, I'm 23 years old. I graduated last year with major science and communication engineering, and I've been like, learning and building on top of the biology in the ecosystem since 2021. And in this uh, hackathon, I'm uh, aiming to build this uh, privacy preserving zero knowledge uh, KYC projects uh, a person. Let me show you the uh, project. Uh, just we have, a, which is something they are at the end of this month. And then it's the center the zero knowledge project to the telephone information and industry and uh, in the project. So private DAOs, which allow investors to fund projects and make decisions through voting while keeping the privacy intact, we have deployed our implementations on Mantle Testnet and Goli. The two main processes are funding and voting. In the funding process, investors can anonymously fund DAOs, while for the voting process, they will decide how DAOs spend their funds. Besides privacy and security, investors should be able to fund or vote with a single transaction. To achieve these requirements, we use ZKP and Threshold homomorphic encryption. In detail, we use a Threshold distributed key generation scheme to hide final results for a period of time. We use Elgami encryptions to hide individual choices, and ZKP is for verifications without disclosing secrets. First, the DKG committee members will contribute to creating a public encryption key, Then, after investor fund DAOs, a number of committee members are needed to finalize the funding round. The idea is quite similar for the voting process. For a deeper understanding of our circles and smart contracts, you can visit our public repo. Some potential use cases are fundraising for startup, DAO for hackathons or grants. For our future work, we will continue to optimize and provide add-on features, and there will soon be a public version deployed on the Mantle mainnet. Thank you for the time. If you have any Hello everyone, today I'm going to introduce you Proof of Innocence R. Here's our team chain name. Tornado Cash is a mixed element Ethereum where you can deposit and withdraw from a smart contract without revealing your anonymity, but it got sanctioned in August 2022. How does it work? On deposit, you create a new leaf in a market tree, and on withdraw, you prove that you are a leaf at the market tree and provide your nullifier to prevent double spending. But the issue is you share the same anonymity set with hackers or illicit accounts. To solve this issue, we created Proof of Innocence where you can prove that you are in the market tree, but you are not a hacker. And so on, Bitcoin and ZK round right now. But there are better privacy protocols where you can deposit and withdraw arbitrary amounts, not only one, one or ten, just like Tornado Cash. To this, there's a new joint split transaction where you can join our split uh, leaves in the market tree. In this photo, the first two leaves are joined to create a new coin. Transactions inside this pool can look like this. To make proof of innocence in these kind of pools, Privacy protocols, we first flatten the transactions. And for every step, we prove that that proof, that step is in our log list. Proofs look like this at first, but with no folding scheme, we can recursively hold every step. 
and at the end we have a single zone of each lung. Inside of the step circuit, it looks like this. Thank you for listening, and you can see the code in our repository. Block Qualified allows users to gain credentials by solving tests directly on chain. These tests can contain both multiple choice questions and open answer questions. We use zero knowledge proofs so that users provide a proof of knowledge of the solution instead of their actual solution. That way, these solutions remain a secret. And by integrating Semaphore, users can prove ownership of a credential without revealing their identity. This app, made on top of this protocol, shows a possible use case, with three simple credentials defined oriented around basic Web3 knowledge. You can access it via the link below. These three are linked to each other, so to obtain the second credential, you first need to anonymously prove via Semaphore that you obtained the first credential. After you generate your private solution proof, meaning your solution is not revealed, you send the transaction to the relayer and gain the credential as a result. Using this relayer increases anonymity as transactions all originate from the same address. After you finish the course, you can generate an anonymous proof of ownership certifying this and send a transaction to the relayer to mint yourself an NFT to whatever burner address you choose. So the process of obtaining this credential was all done on chain, yet you never reveal your solutions nor your identity. In essence, Block Qualified allows you to prove that you have a certain set of qualifications without revealing anything else about yourself, not even who you are. You can prove your qualifications, but these cannot be traced back to you. Hi, I'm Pierre Giuseppe from UC Berkeley, presenting Fact Fortress, a project developed together with Guillaume from Block Demon. Here are our main contributions. Ensuring trust in handling sensitive data with proof of provenance and auditable data access policies. Democratizing circuit construction and deployment. And proposing an end-to-end -end solution from circuits and proof generation to auditable verifications. The inputs of our circuit compiler are the data, the authority owning the data, and the desired computation from our library of functions. The compiler then processes the data and generates all the necessary circuits ready to be proved in zero knowledge. There is proving computation and prominence of the data while revealing zero information on the data itself. Finally, we can deploy our function-specific on-chain verifier as a smart contract. To achieve this, we register a new verifier for each function of our library from our main smart contract. To verify a proof, the verifier receives the authority's public keys and uses them as public inputs. To produce a proof, the analyst can securely access the data via NFT-enabled access policies and they can perform authorized functions in zero knowledge. The smart contract will provide the result and the corresponding proof. Finally, the analyst can confidently publish the results together with the proof. Anybody can read the results, download the proof, and verify publicly on chain. In the demo, you can see data access policies being created and assigned to analysts, data provider defining how the data must be accessed, analysts submitting computation for chosen functions, receiving proof, which can later be verified on chain. To learn more about Fact Fortress, please check out our paper and website. In the world of verifiable gaming, where you always get rewards for play. However, there is a huge problem. These games are the puzzle games or action games, and almost every puzzle game is an answering game where your answer should be checked. And often it's a very short answer. For example, it could be a multiple choice question where the answer set just has four members. So if we hash it and encode in a smart contract, it could be dry run and it could be brute forced in no time. That's why to have this universal gaming building block of verified answers, we need to have an oracle. We need a multi-body, multi at least two-body computation. This problem is called socialist millionaire problem. There are specialized systems to solve it, but as long as we have a general method to prove uh, arithmetic circuits, we can have a nicer solution. Oh, it's some performance cost. My idea is to encode the answer to a point on the elliptic curve. The person does, does it, and an oracle does it. They do a tiffy hellman key exchange proven in circum arithmetic circuits. If they end up at the same point, it means that they had the same starting point, so they had the same answers. If not, then no. Combined with incentive system, it completely solves the problem of brute forcing. Each try is costly. In this video, you saw how this principle can be applied to building something like a capture for the Web3. It's an NFT means which um, works only if you know the correct answer. In general, this can be used not only to protect from bots, but uh, to blockchainify any puzzle game at all. It can be placing mirrors to guide the laser through the labyrinth, or finding one concept which unites for pictures. Any puzzle game which has one solution might be encoded and uh, put uh, in this protocol. Please take a look at the code, at the smart contract itself, and at the Oracle, uh, and I hope this is a nice step for um, gaming, for verified gaming, for everyone in this world. All right, folks, welcome to our project submission demo for uh, the Berkeley Move Hackathon. We are the ZKP2P team. ZKP2P is a trustless, P2P, P2P, is a trustless P2P fiat on-ramp that can be built on top of any Web2 payment rails. Currently, our application uh, features a Venmo. Um, without permission from the payment network itself. The network is powered by ZK proofs of DKIM signatures and payment confirmation emails. We're excited to be exploring this idea as well as extending it to other services. The application is remote hosted, so you can try it out for yourself at zkp2p.xyz. Today, we're going to quickly walk through all of the flows. At a high level, the application connects on-rampers and off-rampers through Venmo, ZK circuits, and smart contracts to exchange USD off-chain for USDC on-chain. We begin as an on-ramper by creating a order here and specifying the amount that they would like to on-ramp. Um, this generates a on-chain order. 
um, an off ramper then comes by scouring the on-chain order book and submits a claim on the order, providing their Venmo ID, which gets encrypted by a key generated by the on ramper uh, that they can use to decrypt later. But they submit a claim on the order. Uh, indicating that they would like to provide the USDC. This effectively escrows the USDC inside of a smart contract. Um, the on-ramper then goes back to their original order. Um, they can decrypt the uh, they can decrypt the uh, Venmo IDs uh, on the claims. Uh, choose a uh, off-ramper to complete the transaction with, and then submit a proof or generate a proof from the confirmation email sent by Venmo. They can then submit that proof on chain and uh, if verified, um, releases the escrow USDC. Um, okay, great. Thanks, everyone. So that concludes the finalist demos for the remaining tracks. So now we are just going to uh, quickly do Recording the uh, in progress. Uh, the winner announcement. Okay. So we are running a little behind schedule. Uh, so we'll just do the quick uh, winner announcement. Okay, great. So thanks, everyone. So that concludes the finalist demos for the remaining tracks. So now we are just going to uh, quickly do the uh, in progress. Uh, the winner announcement. Jack is probably watching the video. Okay. Uh, can you just have him talk? Like he can. He can talk. Yeah. Oh, okay. So so Jack. Uh, so we are. Uh, Jack. Uh, can can you can you start uh, speaking? Just go to the side. So we have the yeah. winner slide presented for the. Uh, Right for the track, uh, uh, writing through large apps with the Snarky JS. So can you just briefly uh, introduce the winners uh, for the track? Yeah, thank you. Uh, so yeah, thank you to Berkeley, Don Song, and everybody involved for making this happen. We've really enjoyed our participation. Uh, this track is focused on Snarky JS, a zero knowledge tool toolkit made by Owen Labs uh, that has quite a few unique features. It's a TypeScript library, so it runs wherever JavaScript does, browsers, Electron, Node, wherever. And it's built on our unique Plonkish proof system, Kimchi, so there's no trusted setup, and there are a few other features. One that's very notable is that it supports infinite recursion. Um, it's targeted to Zika app developers, and it makes it easy to build user-facing applications that leverage privacy, attestation, scalability, cost savings, or uh, you know, data freedom properties of zero-knowledge proofs. And it works out of the box today with Mina, but a huge thanks to the Near Foundation for sponsoring this track as they consider integration as a part of their ZK roadmap. So, we had uh, two winners. Uh, the first is a private access management system made by Elena. Um, it uh, was well designed. The implementation was very clean and it had super good test coverage. It made use of some interesting uh, properties of Snarky JS, like network constraints for blockchain link to prevent replay attacks. And um, Elena also started implementing Shamir secret, Shamir secret Samir secret sharing and a driver's license validation in Snarky JS. Uh, and then we also have Secret Ballot. This is a single stage private voting application. Um, so kind of like a Twitter poll. Um, participants don't need to register to vote. The eligible voters have set a deploy. And uh, this has a cool uh, you know, main file that you can run and it'll actually run you through some example user flows and console logs and the outputs. It also emits relevant events when that's appropriate. Um, yeah, what went well in this hackathon is Snarky Jess made it possible for participants to build sophisticated applications in minimal time. Uh, developers appreciated our comprehensive documentation and made use of our office hours. And uh, projects made use of some of the unique features of our toolkit, like uh, super efficient Merkle trees, trustless setup, custom data structures, and, and, and network constraints. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, some things that we were surprised by is uh, not as many people used recursion as we would have thought. Uh, this probably is because, you know, sort of the first step is, I guess, to build something with Snarky Jess, and then the second step is to build something recursion, but we made that pretty easy. Anyways, that's all. Thanks, guys. Great. Thanks a lot, Jack. Thank you. Um, okay, so next uh, is the uh, the ZK Applications track. Uh, is uh... Yeah. Okay, great. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Yeah, I'll be brief. Um, so in the interest of time, just going to be super fast here, you can see the winners. Um, for their implementation of Senate, 
12,500, great job, love the use of Unity. Um, in second place for their utilization or implementation of Stratego, 7,500, great job. We thought you had some great helper scripts in there and that you did a good job with your documentation. For the lockbox game, um, simple concept, but fun to play, really cool looking, great job, 2,000. And then because you guys did two games and we liked that it was Liar's Dice and Blackjack, 2,000. We're in the back booth over there if you guys have any questions for Alio, and we are hiring. Great, thank yeah. you. Thanks a lot. Um, so the next is a category two. Uh, I don't know whether Merrick or others from Solo. Oh, okay. Great, great, great. Okay. Cool. So maybe in the interest of time, we'll also move quickly. So uh, first place winner. Uh, is Cred Lancer for $3,000. Congratulations, Cred Lancer. Uh, second place, uh, IoT Nexus uh, for $1,000. Uh, and then third place uh, is GMMS for $1,000. Uh, we, we were really uh, pleased with all the submissions uh, and uh, like the other protocols, we're in the back and we'd love to chat with anybody uh, interested in hearing more about Seller. So thank you. Uh, yes, this category in particular uh, focuses on CK4 enabling mobile use cases, so it's a really uh, interesting category as well. Um, so then also there's a category four for um, mental. Uh, so here I'll speak for the sponsors. So there are uh, two first place a VNCK with the price of uh, $1,000 and the non-interactive ninjas with the price of uh, $1,000. Uh, and then uh, finally we have the self-selected tasks. Uh, in this ZK application track. Uh, again, you have seen some of these really exciting uh, applica ZK applications that the teams have built. So uh, with this, the first um, uh, place goes to Fact Fortress with uh, $3,000 in price. And the second place goes to DNZ, uh, $2,000 in price. And uh, um, uh, tight uh, third place, Chainway and FT Technology with $500 each. And uh, again, this is sponsored by Jump Crypto. So with that, uh, thanks everyone. We uh, uh, we ran a little behind schedule, but thanks everyone for being here, and uh, thanks again for all the great, uh, uh, you know, the ZQ uh, PMOOC instructors and uh, the participants for the hackathon, the judges, and everyone. And then we will have the career fair and that in uh, session in the back, and also reception. The food is in the back. So Jocelyn, do you have anything? Oh, okay. So finally, we have uh, we do have a finalist. We have a finalist for one. mantle. Oh, okay. So we have one and finalist. Then, and then another one who I'm not sure who that is. And maybe they can just finalists. quickly say yeah. a few words. So um, yeah, I can like, I allow to talk. Waiting, so. Yeah. Um, so I. If you want to invite them to say a few words. So I think they can. So speak right. Up. So so for VNCK and uh, the other. Um, uh, final uh, uh, awardees, if you are online, you can quickly say a few words. Oh. Uh, so, yes, yeah, so, so food is in the back. Uh, thanks again, everyone. And uh, we, uh, yeah, thank you, thank you. And the, we have the sponsor career table in the back as well, so please. Right. Hi, can you can you hear me? Hello. 